In this video, we're going to talk about the types of crystals. So the learning competency for this video is to describe the different types of crystals and their properties. And these are the learning outcomes. Okay, so the four types of crystals, ionic, covalent, molecular, and metallic crystals, differ in the kind of particles that make up the crystal and the attractive forces that hold these particles together. Let's start with metallic crystals. One example of metallic crystal is copper wire. Okay, so if we're going to describe copper wires, we say that they are dense, right? They have a density of 8.9 grams per cubic centimeter. Copper wires have high melting point, making them a good conductor of heat and electricity. So you can bend a copper wire, right? So we describe them as malleable and ductile. They are also shiny, so we say that they are lustrous. So now, what are metallic crystals? Metallic crystals are made of atoms that readily lose electrons to form positive ions or cations. But no atoms in the crystal would readily gain electrons. Basically, the metal atoms give up their electrons to the whole crystal, creating a structure made up of an orderly arrangement of cations surrounded by the localized electrons that move around the crystal. So this figure shows a cross-section of a metallic crystal. So this model of metallic bonding is called the C of electrons model. Okay, the crystal is held together by electrostatic interactions between the cations and the localized electron. So these interactions are called metallic bonds. So this figure here, shows the unit cell of a copper. So at the lattice point, you can see a metal atom. So if you remember from our previous video, this is a face-centered cube. So this model is able to explain many physical properties of metals, such as their high melting points, malleability, ductility, and etc. This table shows the observed properties and the inference about the structure. As we have said, Metallic crystals are dense. This is because the atoms are packed closely together. Metals exhibit close packing structures, which are the most economical way by which atoms utilize space. They also have high melting point. So a large amount of energy is needed to melt the crystal since the forces of attraction to be broken are numerous and they extend throughout the crystal. In terms of electrical conductivity, the delocalized electrons move throughout the crystal, so it has charge moving around it. Okay. Also, these delocalized electrons collide with each other as they move through the crystal. And it is through these collisions that kinetic energy is transferred. That is why they are good heat conductor. Okay. In terms of malleability, remember that when stress is applied to the metal, the cations shift in position, but the mobile electrons simply follow the movement of the cations. So the attractive forces between cations and mobile electrons are not broken. So they are lustrous because the motion and collisions of electrons allow it to gain and lose energy. And some of these in the form of emitted light that is observed as luster. So this figure shows the crystal structures of metals in the periodic table. Here you can see the hexagonal closed pack. We have beryllium and magnesium. So face-centered cubic for calcium and strontium. Body-centered cubic for lithium, sodium, and potassium. So when these elements combine with another element, for example, sodium and green to form NaCl, it would be a different crystal. Hence, we have what we call the ionic crystals. Ionic crystals are made of ions. So basically, at the lattice point, you can see cations and anions. These ions are held together by strong electrostatic interactions that hold the crystal lattice together. So the electrostatic attractions are numerous and extend throughout the crystal since each ion is surrounded by several ions of opposite charge. Because of that, ionic crystals have high melting points. So the figure here shows a model of sodium chloride crystal. 
where one sodium cation is surrounded by six chlorine anions, and a chlorine anion is likewise surrounded by six sodium cations. So the energy needed to break the crystal depends on, first, the magnitude of charges on the ions. For example, in MgO, magnesium oxide, right? You have 2 plus and 2 minus compared to NaCl. Sodium here has 1 positive. Chlorine here has 1 minus. Okay, so the plus 2 and minus 2 ions in MgO attract each other stronger than in 1 positive and 1 negative in NaCl. Next factor is the size of the ions. So attractions are less between the bigger ions in rubidium iodide and as such less heat energy is needed to separate them than the smaller ions in NaCl. So bigger size less attraction. So ionic substances can conduct electricity in the liquid or molten state or when it is dissolved in water. Okay, so it indicates that in this state, charged particles are able to move and carry electricity. However, the solid state is generally non-conducting since the ions are in fixed positions in the crystal lattice. So they are unable to move from one point to another. One example is rock salt or NaCl. If you try it at home, you can't conduct electricity in rock salt. But if you dissolve it in water and try to put electricity, you will be grounded or shocked. Aside from that, ionic substances are brittle and they would shatter into small pieces when deformed or when pressure is applied on the crystal. So the shifting of ions causes repulsions between particles of like charges. So NaCl, this one, this is your Cl, this is your Cl. So if you apply force here, they will repel each other here. Okay, this table summarizes the properties that we have discussed. Next, let's go to molecular crystals. Molecular crystals are made up of atoms, such as in noble gases or Molecules such as in hydrocarbons. The atoms or molecules are held together by a mix of dipole-dipole, including hydrogen bonding, and dispersion forces. Okay, so for example, methane, CH4. In methane, molecules are held together in the solid only by relatively weak intermolecular forces, even though the atoms within each methane molecule are held together by strong covalent bonds. So these intermolecular forces, or the weak intermolecular forces, are the ones that are broken when the crystal melts, not the covalent bonds. Hence, most molecular crystals have relatively low melting point. So the valence electrons of molecular substances are used in bonding and cannot move about the crystal structure. That is why crystals are non-conducting. In line with that, like the absence of any mobile particles, this makes molecular crystals unable to transmit heat. So we say that molecular crystals are poor conductor of heat. Okay, so the crystals are also brittle because the attractive forces that hold the molecules in the crystal are highly directional and a shift in positions of the molecules would break them. For example, here in ice, okay, so a little change in temperature would break some of the hydrogen bonds, causing them to melt, okay? This table shows the properties of molecular crystals and the inference about the structure, which we have discussed a while ago. Now let's go to covalent crystals. Covalent network crystals are made of atoms in which each atom is covalently bonded to its nearest neighbors. So the atoms can be made of one type of atom, for example, carbon of diamond and carbon of graphite. Okay, so later we're going to talk about it. Or it can be made of different atoms. For example, here in silicon dioxide, 
It is made up of silicon and oxygen atoms. So in a network solid, there are no individual molecules, and the entire crystal may be considered one very large molecule. Formulas for network solids, like those for ionic compounds, are simple ratios of the component atoms represented by a formula unit. Again, when we say formula unit, empirical formula. So the valence electrons of the atoms in the crystal are used to form covalent bonds. And because there are no delocalized electrons, covalent network solids do not conduct electricity. So covalent bonds are the only type of attractive force between atoms in network solid. Therefore, rearranging or breaking of covalent bonds requires large amounts of energy. Therefore, covalent network solids have high melting points. Covalent bonds are extremely strong. So covalent network solids or covalent network crystals are very hard. And generally, these solids are insoluble in water due to the difficulty of solvating very large molecules. Okay? So as you can see here, diamond is the hardest material known. Well, cubic boron nitride is the second hardest. So this one, silicon carbide, is very structurally complex and has at least 70 crystalline forms. Okay, so let's go back to these structures. Diamonds are example of covalent network solid in which atoms are covalently bonded with each other. Same with silicon dioxide, right? So diamonds tend to be hard and have high melting point. Okay, now in silicon dioxide, notice that each silicon atom is bridged to its neighbors by an oxygen atom. So before you go here, you'll have oxygen here. Okay, now in graphite, an allotrope of carbon differs in properties from other network solids. It is soft and is used as solid lubricant. It is also a good conductor of electricity, indicating the presence of charged particles that move through the crystals. So how does this happen? Okay, so if you compare the structures of diamond and graphite, you should notice that in graphite, each carbon atom is bonded to only three other carbon atoms. Okay, this one. You have one, Two, three. Okay? While in diamond, each carbon is bonded to four other carbon atoms. Two, three, and four. Okay? So in addition, graphite is made up of layers of rings of carbon atoms. And these layers are connected by weak intermolecular forces. Okay? So, what are the effects of the differences in structure? Each carbon atom has four valence electrons, making it capable of forming four single covalent bonds with other atoms, like in diamond. In graphite, only three of these four valence electrons are used for bonding, leaving the fourth electron free. So, every carbon atom in graphite has an extra electron that can move about the layer, allowing graphite to conduct electricity. So the layers in graphite are held by weak intermolecular forces, as I have said a while ago. And with sufficient pressure, the layers can slide past one another. That's why when one uses a pencil to write, layers of graphite are transmitted to the paper as one presses the pencil down on the paper. Okay. Now, this table summarizes the properties of covalent crystals and the inferences about the structure. Okay, we already have discussed this. And this table shows the summary of the things that we've discussed. You have here the type of solid, form of unit particles, forces between particles, properties, and some examples.